Cannondale Jekyll GT Force Trek Session Norco Range Da Vinci Spartan Forbidden Dreadnought all of these recently released bikes have come out with a high pivot suspension design. Now it may seem like this is the latest fad, but in fact, that design has been around since the early 90s. So why has it come back and is it here to stay? Or is it all just high pivot hype? full suspension mountain bikes have a main pivot. Now this is just a virtual point that the rear wheel will rotate around when it sinks into its suspension. Most full suspension bikes have a low pivot centered around about the bottom bracket. But this, a high pivot bike, has a virtual pivot point that is much higher, hence the name. Having a high pivot point means that these two points, the rear axle and the bottom bracket, have a much more accentuated or exaggerated movement. Hence, we talk about high pivot bikes having a rearward axle path. Now, this extreme movement gives the high pivot both its benefits and its disadvantages. Now, the benefit of a rearward axle path means that when you're descending down rough terrain, the bike will get less hung up on big hits. So the theory goes that it'll be a smoother ride, but also a faster ride, as all of those little bumps aren't slowing you down. Now, Cannondale believed in this design way back in the early 90s. They brought out the Super V in 1993 and it stuck around for about three years before they axed it due to those odd riding characteristics. Now, the problem with a rearward axle path is that as the cassette moves backwards, it will pull the chain and therefore pull on the cranks. And that's what we know as pedal kickback. And this can be quite disconcerting, especially if it's a force great enough to knock you off your pedals. So this is where this has come into play. This is known as the idler or the pulley wheel. And this effectively reroutes the chain line closer to the main virtual pivot point. So you don't get that chain growth. So you can effectively tune out pedal kickback and stop those disconcerting features that we saw in the early 90s. And it also leaves the suspension to be freed up from any pedaling forces, giving you a nice magic carpet ride. It's important to reiterate that a high pivot point is just referring to that virtual pivot point. It's got nothing to do with the linkage system. Companies can choose a single pivot, a split pivot, a four bar linkage design, and still have that high virtual pivot point. Even the position of the idler can tune in and tune out different braking and pedaling forces. So I think it's fair to say that no high pivot is born the same. But how did we get from the Cannondale in the early 90s to the bikes of today? And why are we seeing so many in the last couple of years? Here's a little history lesson for you. The real high pivot development started in the early noughties where the downhill World Cup scene was seeing rougher courses, less like cross country grassy descents. In 2000, the V process was created specifically with one purpose, and that's for Nico Vullier to win the World Championships on a rough Spanish course that was four minutes long. Sadly, Nico didn't win that World Championships. It was one of the few that he didn't win over the course of about a decade. But to be fair, he did get a puncture, although I think it left a bit of a sour taste in his mouth. Outside of the World Cup, Brooklyn Machine Works was rising to fame. And they got cultural kudos as they were ridden by cool freeriders. And it even begged investment from rapper Pharrell Williams. But outside of the freeriding scene, these bikes were seriously heavy steel freeriders with 24 inch wheels. And so outside of freeriding the streets of New York City, they didn't really prove to be that popular. In 2004, Danny Hart started his downhill career on the Balfour BB7, named that because the pivot point was a whopping seven inches above 
the bottom bracket. We also saw the mysterious Honda RN01 with that secretive gearbox, something we later found out to be more like a derailleur and a cassette hidden away, and it was a probably an attempt to correct the chain line, much like the idler of today. Now, it cost Honda hundreds of thousands to make, which is probably why it never went into mainstream production. Also in 2004, Louis Arrays was starting up the K9 Engineering. It was a four bar linkage design with a high pivot point and he'd added the idler in there. The bike got high praise from the media, but it came with a really detailed user manual and needed to be specifically set up for riders. So perhaps that put the public off. Interestingly, 14 years later, Louis is now the brains behind the GT Force, the GT Fury, and the Cannondale Jekyll. In 2006, Trek brought out the Session 10, which was a single pivot, high pivot design with the idler pulley. Now, they were copying their former free ride hucker, the Diesel, and they wanted to make a seriously fast downhill bike which I believe they achieved, but Trek say they moved away from this platform because they wanted to concentrate on a suspension platform that better worked across multiple disciplines and multiple bikes. By 2015, we had a number of high pivot designs. We had the Antidote Dark Matter, a seriously boutique downhill bike. We had the Ghost DH9000. We had Windmasters racing on the Bulls Wildcore. And we had the Zeroed, a quirky, internally geared bike with Shimano Alpine. But it was Commensal riding addiction team that were playing around with the new Commensal Supreme DH that I think really changed the game. Commensal's commitment to that team year on year and commitment to developing that bike year on year is what I really think secured the high pivot design. Fast forward to 2018 and a relatively unknown French rider, Ormery Perion, bust onto the scene, won three World Cups in a row and took the overall title. And to prove it wasn't a flash in the pan, fellow rider Miriam Nicole took the World Championships in 2019 and 2020. And all of a sudden, this 29er high pivot bike was the hottest, fastest bike on the planet and everyone wanted a piece of the action. By 2021, it had opened the floodgates to high pivot designs. While Commensal were developing their Supreme DH for the World Cup circuit, DV8 Cycles were prototyping an enduro trail bike with the high pivot design. So I wanted to speak to Ben Jones to find out where it all came from and where he thinks it's going. <laughs> Okay, so Ben Jones from DV8 Cycles, tell me, why did you choose the high pivot suspension design for your bikes? Well, I, I didn't choose anything. So. <laughs> okay, Chris uh, did that. Uh, yeah, I, ha I have to be super clear here. So my business partner, Chris, is the designer of the bikes. And, mm. But I believe that Chris um, was in New Zealand um, doing a guiding season and he rode a zero G something, maybe yeah, it was a G1. Yeah, like a G2 or it was the like, earlier ones, yeah. Yeah, it was one of the earlier ones and it was a downhill bike with a gearbox and with a high pivot. Mm. Uh, a very high pivot. This right. thing was this thing was almost on the top tube. It was, <laughs> it was super high. Um, and he loved the way it rode and, you know, uh, Chris is an engineer and he was, I think that got him thinking about the best way to design his own bike. Well, the two things that came from that is one, he really liked the gearbox. He thought the gearbox had some real uh, great advantages um, and he really liked the high pivot and how it rode so our first bike the guide had a gearbox and a high pivot well we saw it a lot in the downhill world cup scene throughout the noughties yeah. basically mm -hmm. and right up to like 2015 2016 which is when you guys were starting to design your deviate suspension platform. Yeah. Um, so why do you think we didn't really see any enduro trail bikes um, at that time? Because you were kind of the first of the few to start designing enduro trail high pivots. Yeah, um, I mean, I think there's a real simple answer to that, and that is one by drivetrains. Right. Uh, I think the high pivot to perform in a trail and enduro setting um, particularly needs an idler. And it's extremely hard to design an idler 
without a one by um, front uh, chain ring. So mm. I think it's that as drivetrains moved on and as we all accepted, you know, 11 and 12 speed one by systems, I think that's given us the ability to kind of execute this this high pivot concept on a trail and enduro bike because in the past one by was a downhill bike right so mm. i think that's why it's been able to make the jump mm. um and there's probably some other factors as well just in terms of what we're able to do on these modern trail bikes and obviously enduro bikes mm. now i mean you know a modern enduro bike is nine tenths a downhill bike in terms yeah. of its perform- performance downhill so you know i think that's given the, the customers uh, or the rider is asking for so much more out of that platform, uh, which is where, you know, we can start experimenting with different suspension concepts that have maybe been a thing in downhill and been successful in downhill. We can kind of start to try and bring them into that space. Um, you know, if you think about it, only 10 years ago, a, um, you know, a trail bike was basically a burly cross-country bike, mm. right? There was, you know, maybe 120 mil of travel, 130 mil of travel, um, you know, there's, there was probably other aspects the suspension designers and bike designers were trying to sort out without starting to to go into uh, introducing these downhill technology. Can I even call it technology? Yeah, technology? yeah, sure. So explain, you mentioned the idler yeah. and that's kind of where, what really changed some things. So explain why do you need it and why the position is so important? The idler allows you to tune the pedaling performance of a high pivot bike effectively. That's the, the key advantage is the place in that idler determines what we call anti-squat, which is effectively how, how the suspension reacts to pedal forces, effectively is what it is. Uh, the other thing that is maybe a little bit more contentious, but is this idea of pedal kickback. So the idler prevents pedal kickback. Uh, the reason it's a little bit contentious is not because it it doesn't exist. It definitely is a concept. It's effectively the the chain lengthening um, under suspension compression. Uh, the the argument is always about how the free hub comes into that. Does that kind of take up the slack? Uh, my ver- my view is that it, uh, and I'm sure there's a correct engineering answer, but is that when you place the idler um, on the pivot, you eliminate that chain growth and you elim- eliminate that pedal kickback, which means that pedaling through rough terrain feels like pedaling through flat terrain. It does, you, the suspension feedback doesn't affect your pedal strokes. The whole argument about pedal kickback is mm. really interesting. Mm. And me and Doddy actually discussed it in a show recently because everyone's talking about it like it's a bad thing. And of course, you don't want a force to kick you off your pedals. Sure. You don't want that mm. resistance on a descent. Mm. But that amount of chain tension does allow you other benefits, doesn't it? So yeah, I mean, it's, so the chain tension and that growth in the in the chain on a lot of platforms, like a non idler platform, is what determines your anti squat, right? So. And again, this is my non-engineer's understanding of it. Um, <laughs> but that is effectively what allows you to uh, allows a suspension designer to in, to create a bike that doesn't squat through its suspension as you're pedaling. So on a lot of bikes, as you put some pedal power down, it firms up the shock, and you know you can kind of use that um, mm. in order to well, in order to get an efficient pedaling platform, right? Uh, the idler eliminates the connection between those two things. So it eliminates the connection between chain growth and anti-squat. The anti-squat is controlled in a different way. So you can achieve exactly the pedal performance and the characteristics you were saying we might want, but without needing the chain tension and the chain growth. And that I think is why the platform's such a um, advantage on a trail and enduro bike you know, is is because you can do both. You can create that really efficient pedaling platform while not having pedal kickback. So yes, on a lot of bikes, you need pedal kickback in order to create the anti-squat. On an idler driven high pivot, you don't. So you disconnect that relationship. I think it's fair to say that no high pivot is alike, really. Even if you have the same linkage design, Even where the idler pulley is positioned can affect it. So, for example, your Highlander and your Claymore, 
well, they're, they're tuned slightly differently, aren't they? Yeah. So explain that to me, why are they so, different and how? Yeah, and it's a really good point. So the idler placement determines the anti-squat characteristics of that bike, so how that bike pedals. So for example, on the Highlander, we went for a slightly higher anti-squat number. So when anti-squat is at 100, uh, that means there's effectively no um, suspension reaction to uh, to a pedaling force. Now that does depend on what gear you're in, and you know it, it does depend on quite a lot of things. But ultimately, around 100 is is no effect. Above 100 is a slight extension of the shock under pedal forces. So with the Highlander, we chose to go um, I think it was about 130 ish uh, somewhere in the middle of the drivetrain so what that gives you is especially when you're pedaling up ground that is uh, you know where you need some traction it effectively extends the shock very slightly as you put in some pedal force uh, and it gives it that kind of snappy feel as you're as you're pedaling up um, technical climbs and stuff on the on the claymore which is designed as very much more of an enduro bike where you're probably spinning up hills um, you know you still want it to be able to to be to handle technical climbs, but you know, most people riding modern enduro are going to be spinning up fire roads. Uh, we tried to make it quite a lot more neutral, so it's closer to that 100% mark. Um, so there's not a huge amount of uh, pedal induced suspension uh, force, if mm. you like, or force going into the damper from, from pedaling. High pivots intrinsically have what's called a high anti rise, so there is a little bit of suspension compression i.e. you will squat into the travel under rear braking and it will firm up that rear suspension as you're braking. Mm. Um, is it a good or a bad thing? Um, the instincts, it's very easy to be like, well, any firming up, any compression of the suspension from a braking force must be a bad thing. My, my um, feelings are that it's not so much of a bad thing, um, especially with the way that um, modern racers are racing, uh, breaking hard into corners. So imagine this, you're breaking hard into a corner, what's going to happen? Your weight's going to go over the front, the weight's going to compress the fork. You know, you need a slack head angle to counter that. But what you're getting on these high pivots on the, on the, with this high anti-rise is you're getting a corresponding compression of the suspension, which holds the geometry. Uh, it holds the wheelbase of the bike and it gives you an awful amount of stability when you need it, when you're braking hard. Is the rear suspension a little bit stiffer? Probably. <laughs> Does it seem to affect anyone that's winning World Cups in these hyper bits? No. Uh, it really it seems as though it's only doing good things for them. So I think it comes down to riding style. Um, it's certainly not any slower. Uh, the, I don't think there's any doubt at this stage that a high anti-rise uh, makes you slower it doesn't um you know is it does that kind of suspension performance if you like or does that kind of suspension um characteristics suit everyone maybe not um i think it suits aggressive riders i think that that kind of kinematic um suits aggressive riders i think it's hard to argue with the results that that we're seeing mm. from high pivot point platforms across uh enduro and downhill at least right in the last two years mm. it seems every man and his dogs brought out a high pivot design you've got yeah. trek da vinci norco cannondale gt mm. why is everyone now bringing one out do you think because it works <laughs> Not that you're biased. <laughs> it does. I mean, if it didn't work, we, you know, everyone's developing high pivots now. Listen, maybe it's a bit of a bandwagon thing. I mean, you know, I think I think the bigger brands have seen the success of maybe some smaller brands uh, mm. in the high pivot space and decided to get in on the action. So there's definitely an element of that. Um, but it works. It works at the highest level. Um, you know, they win downhill races. So do you think there's any future uh, thoughts with the high pivot? Is it the future? Is everyone going to have a high pivot? Are we going to see high pivots on anything else? I don't think you're going to see them on cross-country race bikes. No. <laughs> uh, you're not going to see them on road bikes. Um, yeah. The weight penalty of the kind of infrastructure that goes into mm. it is probably not appropriate. I think a high pivot would suit an e-bike. It makes a lot of sense for an e-bike. Uh, I think you'll see some e-bikes with high pivots. Um, I will neither confirm nor, nor deny <laughs> if we are working on one. Uh, but certainly, I think it would suit. All I'll say is I think it would suit the high pivot platform. I think an e-bike and a high pivot would work really well. 
uh, but there's certainly some engineering challenges that need to be overcome mm. first. Trying to argue that high pivot is better than low pivot is like trying to argue that any suspension platform is better than another. It comes down to rider preference. But what do you guys think? Do you think it's all high pivot hype or are they here to stay? Let us know down in the comments below and join the debate. And we'll see you again soon.